I want to tell you about 123 Ready TV. If you have an Android or a Windows device, like a phone or tablet or a computer, then this application is for you. Now, I watch movies and TV shows from all around the world almost every night. And I'm telling you, without any hesitation, this program is the best thing that I've ever purchased for 20 bucks. It is easy to install. You have to have Wi-Fi and the internet service, but if you have those things, this program is fantastic. So go to oldtimeradiodvd.com today and take advantage of this incredible product. It is the best I've ever seen. 123 Ready TV. Buy it today at oldtimeradiodvd.com. You'll be glad you did. Dramatized by Michael Hardwick, with Carlton Hobbs at home, and Norman Kelly as Dr. Watson. The fifth play, The Crooked Man. Yeah, there you are, Corporal Wood. You said you wanted me. Yes. Oh, listen to them. We're trapped. Ten thousand of the rebels round us, but there's a dozen. And what have we got? Half a battery of artillery, a company of sheep. Why, we've more women and children than we have men. They say the water has run out too, Sergeant. It's true enough. That's what I want you for. Sergeant? The Major says we haven't a dog's chance of fighting our way out of here. We can't last about two days without water with all these women and children. All right, Sergeant. So the only chance is to get word to General Neil Collins. They are moving up country and could just about get here in time. You want me to go? The Major said to send the most responsible entry I could spare. That's you, Corporal Wood, you know that. I'll do it, Sergeant. I didn't need to ask. Now, it's straightforward enough if you can only get past without impeding. You can just hop over the wall, there's no moon, so you can start as soon as you're able. All right, Judge. And keep straight down the water course all the way. All right? Should be easy enough. Those sea boys are as keen as terriers on the wreck cage. You'll need all your luck. And don't leave that water course, whatever you do. I won't. How do I find the column? It should take you straight to their bivouac. If they haven't arrived, wait for them. If they've gone, follow them. But get them here as fast as they can move. There's innocent lives depending on you, Corporal. I know. I know, Sergeant. I'll get straight off then. Good luck. Oh. Well, Watson, may I come in? Oh, of course, my dear fellow, of course. Yes, my wife just came to bed. I'll, I'll call her down again. No, 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 pray don't disturb her. Oh, very well. Ah, I see you still smoke that Arcadia mixture of your bachelor days. <laughs> come and sit down. <laughs> How do you know that? That fluffy ash on your lapel. Mm. There's no mistake you. <laughs> Dandy, fellow. Hmm. With pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry to see you've got the British workman in the house. Mm -hmm. He's a token of evil. Not the drains, I hope. No, the gas. <laughs> but how did you know? He's left two nail marks from his boots on your linoleum. Well, there. Just so the light strikes you. Huh? You see? <laughs> Excellent hope. <laughs> Elementary. Ah. Your good health and Mrs. Watson, too. And yours. <clears throat> I hoped I might not be too late to catch you. Well, did you work on the case? Mm. One of the strangest that ever perfected a man's brain. You know, I find myself in the same position as the readers of those little sketches of yours. <laughs> I hold in my hand several threads, and yet I lack the one or two which I need to complete my theory. But I'll have them, Watson. I'll have them. I'm sure. <laughs> and with your help, if you will. I'd be delighted. Could you go as far as Aldershot tomorrow? Certainly. This is quite in your line of country. An army matter. Mm. You know the Royal Mallows, of course. No, they're one of the best Irish regiments in the British Army. Fine body of men. 
I'm told they did wonders in the time here. And the mutinies, they were besieged in Burkey. Held off 10,000 mutineers for days until Neil's column got through to them. Yes, brave fellows. Do you know anything of that colonel? The prison one? No, nothing. His name was Barclay, one of the bravest of them, apparently. He was a sergeant at the time of the siege you speak of. He was commissioned for his gallantry and eventually lived to command the regiment he had entered as a private. Holmes, you, you said his name was Barclay. Yes, I did. It's his supposed murder I've been asked to investigate. We take the 1110 from Waterloo, Watson. The details can wait until the morning. Down so quickly, Mr. Holmes. Delay can sometimes hamper my investigations, Major. Oh, may I introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, Major Murphy. How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Will you step across from me, gentlemen? Oh, uh, if you'll forgive me, Major, just a quick word here, I think. And then I should like to pay one or two visits. Anything you wish, Mr. Holmes. In brief, I understand from your letter that Colonel Barclay's family life appears to have been a uh, Perfectly a happy one? Absolutely. You said he was regarded as dashing joking. Yeah. She is a woman of considerable beauty. Exactly, sir. They've been married, oh, 30 years. And we all regarded them as a very model of a middle-aged couple. And yet, Colonel Barclay was subject to a sudden fit of depression. Yes, creating. In the middle of some jollity in a mess, I seen a smile wiped off his face. Just like that. Indeed? Yes. And for no apparent reason. He'd be sunk in a depth of gloom for days. Can you explain that, Doctor? Not without more to go on. Had he any other peculiarities? Superstitious. Mm. Terrible. Almost haunted. And afraid of the dark. Well, unusual, little soldier. <laughs> I know it sounds purer than a man like that. But there it is. Very well. Now, Major, I think we'd better begin our little round of visits with a call upon Mrs. Bart. Uh, well, Mr. Holmes, I'm afraid her doctor is adamant. But she should have complete rest and no visitors to the finding. But, Major, sooner or later, in the interest of justice, and particularly in her own interest, it is advisable that I should hear her story from her own lips. I realize your difficulty, Mr. Holmes, but you will appreciate, I'm sure, that Mrs. Barclay has sustained a severe shock. And although she has recovered somewhat, I think it would be better if you made your inquiries elsewhere. Well, I, I can, of course, see Mrs. Barclay later, if necessary. But meanwhile, where do you suggest I begin? That's I see Miss Morrison. Who is she? Friend of Mrs. Barclay. Lives in the villa next door. I think you'll find she'll be able to help you. Well, so you are, Doctor. Thank you, ma'am. But you'll see, Mr. Holmes, Nancy Barclay and I were both members of the Field of St. George. Uh, the Field was the distribution of cast off clothing to the poor. Yes. On the night of the. Uh, that night. She and I went to a guild meeting together. Did she say anything to you suggestive of a disagreement with her husband? Oh, no. There was nothing at all. I'm sure they were on their usual good terms. Did you or anyone else, Miss Morrison, say anything to her that evening which might have changed her attitude towards him? Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry, madam. I must leave no possibility unconsidered. Then the answer is no. I sat next to her to our thinking. I accompanied her to it and came home with her. Nothing of the kind was said. Well, then I think if you have nothing further to tell us, we'd better waste no more time before talking to the Barclay servants. James Stewart, the housemaid, and William Finn, the coachman. Yes. Uh, they've been left in charge of the villa for the time being. So I believe. You'll find them both very reliable. Uh, so, to your knowledge, Finn, uh, Mrs. Barclay left home in entirely normal circumstances that evening. Yes, sir. Yeah. I heard her call out to the colonel to say she wouldn't be long. Did he answer her? Sure. Friendly as you like. Now I believe we come to your evidence, Miss Stewart. Yes, sir. When Mrs. Barclay came in, I guess I'm for knowing this one. She came into the morning room here. She rang for me to bring her a cup of tea and I went to get it. Was well, Colonel Barclay with her? Not at first, sir. He was in the dining room. She often sat on there after dinner. Yet she came straight in here. Yes. It's just funny, like, sir. This room is never used much in the evening. I happen to be drawn the blinds and lit the lamp. She must have lit it herself before she rang. I see. Now tell me, was she herself 
Did you say? Yes. I've never known her ask for tea before the meeting. Now I come to think of it, she was... Uh, a bit jumpy like. Uh, can you get down here at this and jump, sir? I can't, sir. I can only say she seems in a hurry for the cup of tea. Very well. So what happened next? The caramel must have helped Mrs. Barclay away from me, because just after I left her, I, I saw him come from the dining room into here. Tell us what happened next, please. I prepared the tea and came back here, only I couldn't get in. The door was locked, and no one came to open it. You knocked more than once? Two or three times. But they were having such a row at one another. Oh, that they couldn't hear me. Now, I want you to be extremely careful. Did you hear what either of them was saying? I couldn't hear what the colonel said. Only his voice, sort of low and abrupt. But Mrs. Barkley was going on at the top of her voice. You coward, she kept yelling. You coward. Give me back my life. I'll never breathe the same air as you again. That's right, sir. I come through to see what it was all about. And we left it together outside the door, didn't we? Yes, up to where it was, right. Well, suddenly there, there was this awful shout from the colonel, eh? And then this crash. Uh, and Mrs. Barkley began screaming the place down. I, I put my shoulder to the door, but, but I couldn't budge it. So I ran out to the house and round to the lawn. One of them French windows was open. I come straight through it into the room. The mistress was on the floor. Fainted, she had. But the colonel, he was lying right by the fender just where you're standing, sir. His, his head was all blood. What a terrible business. Uh, that's about what I was after thinking, sir. But now, here's the funny part. I, I run to the door here to, to, to tell Jane to go for a doctor, but there was no key in the door. No key? And the police haven't found that key from that moment to this. We had to have a locksmith from all the shop to get the door working again. But didn't the police find it on the body or, or on Mrs. Barker? Not the trace of it, sir. Now, this is important, remember. Can either of you recall anything else that you heard either the Colonel or Mrs. Barclay say during their quarrel? Well, I heard the thing Daisy twice. Daisy? Uh, yes, but the Colonel's name was Jane. You're perfectly sure of it. I swear to it, sir. Thank you. Then that will be all. My friend and I will remain here a little longer in order to examine the room. You go only to me if you want anything, sir. Thank you. So, <laughs> Watson, while I look round the room, Paul, tell me what you make of it all. I'm afraid it's all too plain. They had some quarrel, and the heat of which his wife struck him down. And then she fainted with horror at what she'd done. What do you make of the missing key? Nothing significant. Either of them could have locked the door when their quarrel began, thinking perhaps that the servant might come walking in. Yes, but the key is missing. Neither of them had it. Sit down somewhere, it'll come to light. It hasn't so far. No, Watson. The absence of that key argues to me that a third person was present here. A third person? He or she carried that key away. And since we can assume that he or she entered by the open French window in the first place, I think our researches must now lead us to the law. Now, Watson, you know my method. What do you make of these? Footprints? Distinct one. Hmm. You see? Yeah. As I did you, she came over that low wall and went straight to the French window. In fact, she, she rushed across the lawn. How do you know that, Holmes? The toe marks are deeper than the heels. What? What, what do you make of his companion? There's only one set of prints. Look again. What? Yes, 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 you're right, but it's, it's a dog or something. Did you ever hear of a dog running up a curtain? Oh, no, no. I found distinct traces that this creature had done so. Well, a monkey, then. These are not a monkey, Prince. Oh, oh, hang it, I don't know. Here are four prints, you see? Mm. Where the creature stood motionless for a moment. Yes. It's no less than 15 inches from four foot to hind. Now, add to that the length of neck and head, and you get a creature... Not much less than two feet long. More, says any tail. Yeah. But where it's been moving, its stride is only about three inches. Hmm. 
It's not been considered enough to leave any of its hair behind for us to examine, but at least we have an indication of a long body with very short legs attached. Still don't know what to make of it. Anyway, what had it to do with the crime? That also is obscure. But we've learned a good deal, you see. We can picture the man standing in the road looking over that wall towards the house. Yes. The blinds were not drawn. The lamp was lit. We could see everything. Perhaps even here, the box is closed. Yes, that's true. He ran across the lawn accompanied by the strange animal and entered by the open French window. Then he either struck the colonel down or, as is equally possible, the colonel swooned at the sight of him and cracked his head open on the fender. And then the fellow went to work again, taking the key in. Hmm? Perhaps. Holmes, you're making the whole business more obscure than ever. Then we must take steps to make it less so. How? I'm interested in that quarrel, Watson. A quarrel for which there appears to have been no good reason. Unless... What? Mrs. Barclay leaves home on perfectly amiable terms with her husband. She returns agitated and engages in a furious quarrel with him. So, during the intervening period, she has been constantly with Miss Morrison, their near neighbor whom we saw just now. An attractive, ethereal girl with timid eyes and blonde hair. Well, could it be, Watson, that there has been something between the Colonel and Miss Morrison, which the latter had taken occasion to confess to his wife during that walk homeward? Mm. It would account for Mrs. Barclay's furious homecoming. It would offer some explanation for her going immediately to a room where she could brood without the likelihood of encountering her husband. And for her flying to tea, as an agitated woman will. <laughs> well, it's a colorful theory, Holmes, but I think it's wrong. I'll tell you what, why don't we see Miss Morrison again? Take her with it. We'll soon know then whether she's hiding the truth. Yes, Watson, I'm more than ever convinced that Miss Morrison owes the clue to this business. No, Mr. Holmes. I don't resent your invitation. In fact, I can see plainly how you must have arrived at them. It's my fault for not telling you the truth before. My theory is correct, Miss Morrison. It is entirely wrong. Then I hope you will have the goodness to set me right. I... I will tell you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. We were returning from our guild meeting at about a quarter to nine. Yes. On the way, we had to pass through Hudson Street. It's very quiet there, and there's only one street lamp. Just as we were approaching the lamp, I saw a man coming towards us. He seemed to be deformed in some way. Deformed? Uh, his back was very bold, and he, he walked with his head low and his knees bent. He had something like a box slung over one of his shoulders. We were passing him, and he raised his face to look at us in the circle of light thrown by the lamp, and as he did so, he stopped and cried out, It's Nancy. You was a Christian then? Yes. She turned as white as death and would have fallen down if I hadn't supported her. I thought of calling out for policemen, but to my surprise, she spoke civilly to this dreadful looking creature. What did she say? She said, I thought you had been dead in 30 years, Henry. It's awful to hear the way he replied, Mr. Holmes. She said, Yes, I have been dead. Well, I, I didn't know what to think, but Nancy didn't seem afraid at all. She asked me to walk on a little ahead while she had a private word with the man. She was trembling, though, as if she'd had some terrible shock. You overheard nothing of what they said? No, and she said nothing about it to me until we reached my gate. But she was trembling even more. Then she kissed me. And said the man was an old acquaintance who had come down in the world. And she begged me never to speak about him. There, Mr. Holmes. That's my secret. I can see now that I was wrong to keep it from the police. In a way, Miss Morrison, I'm not sorry. It has meant that your story has reached my ears first. Thank you, Miss Morrison. Good day to you. Good day. What? We have no time to lose in finding this fellow. There can't be many such a thing in all the set. If we begin our inquiries immediately, we may track him down before he thinks of leaving. Come along. What? 
What do you want? He's called over this little matter of Colonel Bartley's death. What should I know about that? You do know it, I think. I read the papers. Then you probably gathered that unless the matter is cleared up, your old friend Mrs. Bartley will be tried for murder. I... Are you the police? No. You'd better step in. Thank you. I don't know who you are, nor how you come to know anything about Nan, Mrs. Bartley, to me, but will you swear that you're not out to trick me into something? Who killed Colonel Bartley? He didn't. She's innocent, completely. I swear. Did you kill him? No. Then who did? It was Providence, did it? Providence? We'd better have your story, if you please. Look at me now. With my back like a camel. My ribs are awry. I can tell you, there was a time when Corporal Henry Wood was the smartest man in the 117th foot. 117? Isn't that now the... The 1st Battalion, the Royal Mallows. That then, sir. Go on, please. We were in India then, a place called Bati. Barclay was a sergeant in the same company as me. Oh, yes, he came up in the world since those days. Well, there, there was a lot of wives and families with us, too, and the belle of the regiment was Nancy Du Bois, the daughter of the color sergeant. You may smile when you look at this poor thing before you now. But I was the man she loved. I was just a harem scarum restless lad, and Barclay had had an education and was already marked for the sword belt. It, it was him her dad wanted her to marry, but she wouldn't. She held true to me, and if it hadn't been for the mutiny, she would have been mine. Bertie. Of course you did in that scene. I was. We all of us was. Ten thousand screeching rebels round us and not a drop of water left. And that's when Barclay sent me out to make contact with General Neal's column. So you carried the message that brought Neal to rescue. It must be a proud memory for you. Oh, a memory, all right. Only I never got to the column. You didn't, but then how... I you... hadn't gone a hundred yards down the water course Barclay showed me to follow before I ran into an ambush. He stunned me and bound me hand and foot, and for what I could hear when I came round those... Heisman had done it because my comrade, Barclay, the very man who arranged the way I was to take, had betrayed me to a native servant into the hands of the enemy. I've never heard of that treachery. Do you mean to say that you risked the safety of all those men, women, and children just to, just to get rid of a rival in love? He did, sir. He did. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, no, but I, I can't accept I, I, I'm telling the truth. Every word, you believe me, sir, don't you? I'll send General Neal to the relief of the garrison, then. Another messenger had already been sent, as I found out later. Barclay knew this. He knew that all that needed to be done had been, but he saw a chance to get rid of me. And he took a great heaven. What happened to you, then? Neal came. The mutineers retreated. They took me with him. Many a long year before I saw White Face again. I was tortured. I tried to get away. I was tortured again. Look what they say left me, gentlemen. Look at me. Don't tell him the truth, Elder. And he says he is tortured. Come now, Wood. We must hear the rest if we have to help Mrs. Barclay. I was going to murder. I was arrested by some ill folk after I'd lost count of the years. But what use was it for me, broken crippled, to go back to the army or to England? I wandered about India, living amongst the people. I'd rather that Nancy and my old pal to think that Harry Wood dying with his straight back than Crawley with a stick. That it couldn't be. How did you make a living? A few conjuring tricks I picked up. And they're what brought me home again. I, I wanted to see England once more before I die. And I knew that where there were soldiers, I'd be able to scrape a living, amusing them with a few tricks. Yes, sir. And then, the other night, I, I, I saw my Nancy. Without 
Really, Cynthia, I, I told her what her husband had done to me those long years ago. I got all worked up as I did so. And then you ran to their house and saw them quarreling. She yes. had no doubt tapped him with his conduct to you. You burst in. Yes, it. yes, yes. And, and that's what did it. The plain sight of you was, was like a bullet so his guilty heart. I've never seen such a look on a man's face before. Like, like, like he, he had a fit. So he, 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 he fell right back and crushed his head. But I, I swear... He was dead before he hit the ground. And then Mrs. Barclay fainted? Yes, sir. She had the door key in her hand. I took it from her to unlock the door and summon help, but then I thought better of it, and I shoved the key in my pocket. I I grabbed hold of Teddy. Who? Teddy. Uh, here he is, sir. Uh, in this box. A mongoose. I should have known. Of course. The devil he is. The cobra, sir. I have one in that box over there. He, he's had his fangs taken out and, and Teddy captured him every night in the barracks canteen to amuse the land. <laughs> <laughs> pays the rent of these rooms. That's <laughs> Teddy. He pays the rent of these rooms, doesn't uh, he? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, have I given you all you want to know? For the moment. We may have to apply to you again if Mrs. Barclay should prove in trouble still. I'll come forward, sir. With a will. Good man. Listen. Listen, gentlemen. There's the old bar. Here they come down this very street. We can watch them from this window. Oh, it takes me back to that soon, gentlemen. Corporal Henry Ward, 117 foot. Not a straight of back in the army, gentlemen. Not a straight of back. Devil. Yes, Watson. Uh, but at least he has the satisfaction of knowing that for 30 years his wrongdoer's conscience has been burdened. Yeah. But Holmes, there is just one point. Your husband's name was James. His name is Henry or Harry. The name was strictly heard mention of an. A baby. One word, Watson, which should have told me the whole story. Had I been the ideal reasoner you're so fond of depicting, it is a term of reproach. Of reproach? Yes. King David prayed a little now and then, you know. And on one occasion in the same direction as Sergeant James Barclay. Mm. You remember the small affair of Uriah and Bathsheba? My biblical knowledge is a trifle rusty, I fear, but you'll find the story in the first or second book of Samuel. <laughs> in The Crooked Man by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized for radio by Michael Hardwick, part of Sherlock Holmes is played by Carlton Holmes. Dr. Watson by Norman Shelley, Corporal Wood, Alan McClelland, Miss Morrison, Eva Stewart, Major Murphy, Alan Dudley, William Flynn, William Eagle, James Stewart, Beth Boyd, Sergeant Barclay, Douglas Hankin. The play, which was recorded, was produced by Martin C. West. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes again. A series of nine stories by Sir Arthur Collins.